God is in this place today. The presence of God is in this place. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we step into your presence. Lord, we know that we cannot do it without you. Lord, we know that in you all things are possible. And Lord, we thank you that that reviving spirit is being fanned this morning. That revival spirit is being blown upon this morning. Lord, we send the word right now to Oglethorpe, where they're just beginning service. Lord, bring down in your house in Oglethorpe. Lord, let them have such a move, such a different move of you, oh God. Lord, I ask that you surround Spain. Lord, that you speak in him. You speak through him. And Lord, that you would bless the works of his hands. Lord, let his ears be attentive unto your still small voice. Lord, that there would be salvation, that there would be deliverance, that there would be healing, and there would be newness in you. And Lord, what we've been taught that what we cause to happen to others, Lord, you will cause to happen to us. Lord, I know it's raining outside. I know it's cold outside. But God, this is the day you have made. We're going to rejoice. 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 Is anybody hearing me this morning? We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I believe God is fanning some things in our lives and in our souls and in our spirits this morning.
but the things that's under your feet. Amen. Does not my word say give no place to the devil? Give no place to him. For when he's done his worst to you, I'm going to do my best for you. I'm bringing you into new places in me. And the door is about to swing wide open. Amen. And when it does, will you be ready? Will you be ready? I am opening portals all over this nation. And whoever desires more of me will get under this spout. And you'll see why I'm gone. You'll see the goodness that can only come from me. Open your hearts to me this day. Open your spirit and your minds up to me this day. And watch what I will do. Don't look to the left or to the right. But keep your eyes fixed on me, saith God. Keep your eyes fixed on me, saith God. For when they're fixed on me, you will not be distracted by the enemy. You will not be fearful. You will not be doubtful. You will not bury in your heart. But when your eyes are fixed on me, you will know that I am not done yet. Save the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. My message, ironically, this morning is it's not over. <laughs> It's not over. I woke up this morning and I went to bed late last night praying and interceding not only for today, for the services here, but for the services that Shane is in right now. See, what you may not understand is Things are shifting. Things are opening in the spiritual realms. Things are doing. They're becoming fulfilled just as the Lord said they would. He gave a word not too long ago to us that said one would be here spreading the word and one would be here spreading the word. And he's just getting started. Remember, when God moves, we move. And when God stays, we stay. Because anything outside of the presence of God, I don't want it. Anything where the Spirit of God is not moving, I don't want it. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Because it is a picture of restoration. It is a picture of redemption. 
It is a picture of the goodness of God. In verse 1 it says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. See, and we, even when the enemy comes in to steal God's hedge of protection, is still wrapped around our children, our loved ones, our family members. He can do what he wants to them for a time and for a season, but he can't touch their lives. Verse 3, so David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Verse 4, then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been in a situation where you were so beside yourself that you wept until you could weep no more? That you had no more strength, no more power to weep? It's amazing how when all of our feelings are exhausted and all of our efforts are exhausted, when we have no more power to weep, God can then step in and take over. Because the Bible says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It also says that when I am weak, then he is strong. So even though it looked like devastation to David and his men, God was not done yet. It said, and David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. But David <coughs> encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Sometimes we get into situations where, you know, we, we try to find comfort in our, our spouse, our children, our, our uh, pastor, our church family, and, and all of those are great. That, that's, the, that's what the body of Christ should do, is to love and encourage and uplift the, the brothers and sisters in Christ. But what happens when they're unreachable? What happens when they're going through struggles themselves? What happens when you find yourself all alone? What happens when you find yourself right in the middle of the naysayers who don't know what to do? Maybe they are vacillating in their faith because each one of us is given a measure of faith. What do you do when you're so grieved and you have no more power to weep about your present situation? David encouraged himself <coughs> in the Lord. I heard it mentioned this, this week. I was watching something, and I had to laugh because Jesse Duplantis, I was watching him, and he said, you know, sometimes <coughs> you've got to talk to yourself. Sometimes you've got to motivate yourself. I even, he said, I even had an altar call with myself. I had to say, you need to bring it to the altar. And then I came to the altar wherever I was at, and I gave everything to God and reminded myself who I was from him. Amen. Sometimes we've got to do that extreme measures because Satan is, <coughs> is roaring as a lion. He is roaming about seeking whom he may devour. He was hoping to devour David because what was coming out of the lineage of David a 
of Satan, like you, you, you scream it to, to in the face of Satan. So that, to something about the name of Jesus. It's by no circumstance and, and no coincidence that you're going through what you're going through because Satan desires to sift you and take you out. He's wanting to take you out to stop the seed of the future. He's wanting to stop you. He's wanting to destroy you. But David knew. Number one, he knew the God in whom he served. And even though devastation had appeared, and even though his own men were pointing fingers <coughs> through their own grief and through their own disruption. They were pointing at him and saying, stone him because he's the reason this has happened. David knew the answer. David got alone with God. He got alone with God. Well, see, what will God find you doing in the middle of the fires? What will God find you doing when all hell is breaking loose around you? Well, what will God find you doing and, and see you doing when everyone that you talk to is down in the dumps? You might as well give it up. You might as well shut the door on this. This is an impossible situation. You made your own bed. Now you lie in it. David encouraged himself in the Lord because David knew, God, you have given me purpose. You have given me a destiny that the enemy wants to snuff out. But God, I know that you have not led me this far to leave me in the wilderness. I know that you have not left me so God, I'm going to encourage myself in you. It's amazing how sometimes we call ourselves children of the Most High God. But when trouble comes, we fall apart like the world. I'm going to say that again. It's amazing how sometimes we call ourselves children of the Most High God. But when trouble comes, we fall apart like the world. Don't you know that when trouble comes, that's when the world's watching you? That's when it counts. That is when the real test comes. What are you going to do when the fires get turned up seven times hotter? Are you going to fall apart like the world and show the world, well, they're just like me. They can't offer me anything. Are you going to stand strong in the fullness of the word of God and say, for God I live, for God I die. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but I'm going to encourage myself today because the God that I serve will not fail me. He will not turn his back on me. He is when trouble comes, what is your first reaction? Do you fall apart? Most of us do. Because we're still flesh. But my question is, how long do you stay there? How long do you fall apart? How long do you react and live out fleshly things? Because, see, the Bible says that when, when we accept the Lord Jesus as our Savior, he has made all things new. All things new. Which means that when trouble comes against us, you can't act like your old self. Because all the old things are passed away. He makes all things new. Many of us want to see our children and our grandchildren come to the Lord. And our life is a walking billboard. And they're watching you when trouble comes, when sickness comes, when impossibilities come. And they're watching how is she or he going to hold up in the, the pressure of life. Are we speaking the same words that the world says? Oh, I don't know about this one. Oh, I hope. Oh, I hope. No, 
Because your hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he said it, he's going to do it. If he promised it, he's going to do it. If he started it, he's going to fulfill it. We cannot waver in our speech, in our communication, in our thoughts, in our walk with God. David did not do that. It said that he went, he went until he had no more power to weep because he was human. We're all human, but he did not stay that way. When he found out, when he got all of himself out, he said, now I know what I've got to do. Sitting here crying is not going to get my wife and family back. In fact, he had two wives. He, sitting here whining about it and carrying on and saying what if, should have, could have, would have is not going to answer anything. I have to go to the one who holds the answer. I have to go to the one and that will tell me, shall I pursue? Sometimes you've got to separate yourself from those who are Weighing you down. Sometimes you have to separate your, your, your listening. What are you listening to? Are you listening to, well, it was your fault. You did it. Uh, you reap what you sow. That is the word. You do reap what you sow. But you know, some people use that in the wrong context. Battles come against you not because you did anything wrong, but because you're doing something right. Amen. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And he got along with God. In verse 8, it said, David inquired of the Lord. He said, shall I pursue after this truth? He said, shall I pursue David knew if I, it doesn't matter if I have people with me. It doesn't matter that things are, are going. It, it doesn't matter that the men that, that are with me, they're double-minded in all their ways. What does the word say about being double-minded? Unstable. They're unstable. Will God find you unstable when trouble comes? Because that's not who he's created you to be. He doesn't want you double-minded. He wants you God-minded. He wants you that your mind so filled with the word of God that you will remember when trouble comes, you'll remember what the word says. Fear not. I am with you. I will go before you. If you'll call upon me, I will deliver you and show thee great and mighty things. He said, shall I pursue after this truth? Shall I overtake them? You know, David was very, he was not perfect by no means, but we know that. But he had a heart after God. He, he didn't say, shall we pursue? He didn't say, shall we overtake them? He said, shall I? Yes. Pursue. Yes. Because sometimes we get so caught up. If nobody else goes for the Lord, then, then we don't go. If everybody else decides to stay home, then we stay home. If everybody else decides that we're not having prayer time, then we decide we're not ha having prayer time. But that's not what the Word of God says. There's got to be a leader. There's got to be a light for the Lord, even in the midst of darkness. He said, shall I pursue? Because David knew, if you send me, God, I'm not going alone. I know that greater is he that is within me than he that's in the world. All these other whiners and, and criers and powders can do what they want, and they can catch up when they will. But for me, I know the God in whom I serve. He said, shall I pursue after this truth? Shall I overtake them? Many of us have to ask God. We're asking God the wrong questions. We need to ask God, shall I pursue after this enemy? Shall I overtake him? Amen. We're not asking the right questions of God. Amen. Because David knew if I pursue, I am going to overtake them. But what's more important to me, I don't want to step ahead of God. I don't want to 
to be outside the will of God. I don't want to be outside the presence of God. It was David that said, take not thy presence away from me, O Lord, because he valued the presence of God. And it says, the Lord answered him, pursue, for thou shalt surely, surely overtake them. You know why I think that it says surely? Because God was with him. And everywhere that we go that God is with us, we will surely overtake. Everywhere our feet are, surely we will overtake. Because the Lord is with us. He said, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, without fail, you're not going to fall. You're not going to fail. You're not going to stumble. Without fail, you will recover all. All. Not some. Not the remnant. Not the, the pieces left behind by the enemy. He said, you will recover all. That was promise enough for David. Yeah. That was motivation enough for David. Hallelujah. He didn't care who was going with him. He didn't care if he had to go by himself. Because the Lord spoke and he said, go after them. Take back what was yours. Yeah. And without fail, you're going to overtake them. You're going to recover all. Now, we're going to jump down to verse 16, but you can read nine, verses 9 through 15 later. But it talks about how he had, David had 600 men, and 200 couldn't hang. They got tired. Did that mean the mission was over? No. Did that mean the assignment was done? No. Did that mean that it had become an impossibility because no. now David had 200 less men? No. I'll put it in today's terms. Because people around you say, I'm done with church, I'm done with God, does that mean your mission is done? No. no. Oh, hallelujah. Preach it. You must preach it. Hallelujah. You need to just, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. There is a period of time, and I believe that all the experiences that God has led us, us, all of us, to go through is a teaching moment. Not only for us, but for people that we come in contact with. I had grown up in church all my life. Got married and, and still kept God first. Stayed in church. Kept the kids in church. And there was a time because God was trying to show Shane something. Prepare him. Remember I told you, he always prepares before he positions And there was a time that Shana said this many times before that he got spills hurt in church. He, he got hurt by church. He said, I'm done. And he walked away. And it caused friction in, in our marriage because I said, God, this is this is not what I signed up for. I know he's called. I know that you have purpose for him. And at the time, all three of the kids were, were real small. Lexi was still in the carrier seat. And I, I, was, I told him, I said, you do, you figure out what you got to figure out, but I'm keeping the kids with me. They need stability. And every Sunday morning and every Sunday night, I would load the kids up in the car, and it would be a struggle. And one Sunday <coughs> morning, I was in my car, and I was crying. And I said, God, I don't understand. This is so difficult for me. The mental anguish, the, the physical anguish, I don't understand because this is not what I signed up for. And God spoke to me so clearly and said, if he never comes back, what are you going to do? If he decides that he's not going to come back in, in under my anointing, what do you, what is your choice? Sometimes we got to get a yes. wake up, shake out of it. Yes. We 
would argue all the time and things were not going right. And I thought, God, I, I'm doing all that I can for you. I don't understand. And one of the conversations that we had and that I had with others is that they use the scripture about the man is the head of the household and the spiritual lead. That's exactly right, and I fully support that. But I also said it's real hard to follow a parked car. You ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Somebody's got to lead. Yeah. Somebody's got to get in the driver's seat. Yeah. When you decide where your seat is, when you decide where, where your position is, and we can swap. David knew he had to do something. He had to keep going for God. Even when he could not see a way out, even when 200 men said, no, nah, I'm done. This is too hard. David could have said, okay, well, 200, since, since you are tired, we'll sit with you. But you'll read, David went on. You stay here. We're going to we are going to move forward. Yes. Yes. Why I'm speaking this, I don't know. But it is very important <coughs> for the people around you to know what's keeping you stable. To know what's keeping you going. Because you people are watching you. They are watching how you react in good times, but they're really watching how you react in bad times. They're wanting to know, is she just like me? Is he just like me? Is he going to be a foul mouth Peter and, and every time that something goes wrong, he's going to cuss people out? Or is he going to stand strong and have a smile on the on his face and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord today because God is my source. God is my king. And God is my provider. And many times we forget about going to God. It didn't say that David held a council a meeting. <coughs> what should we do? He didn't he didn't he didn't consult Facebook. He didn't consult Twitter. He didn't consult the newspaper, the news media, email. He didn't do all these things that we so often do. Amen. I laugh because I read certain posts and when people respond in a way that they don't like, they say it's none of your business. Oh, I beg to differ. You made it everybody's business when you put your business out on social media. You don't want somebody disagreeing with you? David knew the answer. David said, I'm going to go to God. Yeah. Because man can't help me. Man is unreliable. Man is unstable. Even when they don't want to be. Even when they don't mean to be. But my God. My God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God who allowed me to escape from the lion and the bear and, the, and Goliath is the same one who allowed me to escape the very hands of Saul. And because of the Amalekites, I don't care how many there are, when God is on your side, it doesn't matter who is against you. Verse 16, it says, and when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. Do you know that the enemy is carrying on laughing because he thinks he has you? He thinks that, oh, I've done it now. Look at her cry like a little baby. 
Look at her ball up in a field position in the, in the corner. Look at her with her back against the wall. She, she doesn't know what to do. I've got her right where I want her. No, what, what Satan doesn't understand is whatever position we are at is the position that God has for us. It's not Satan that has us. It's God that has us. And we will recover all. He's going to recover all of our peace. All of our joy. He's going to recover our relationships. He's going to recover our children. He's going to recover our grandchildren. He's going to recover our faith and our finances. He's going to restore unto us the years that the pearl worm and the temple worm have stolen. Verse 17 says, and David smote them from the twilight even until the evening of the next day. He fought all day and all night. You know, think about that. He fought all day and all night. I'm sure that the amount of fighting the amount of strength it took, the stamina, the endurance was wearing thin, was weighing heavy on their physical bodies. But you know what kept them afloat? What they were expecting was greater than what they were feeling. What they were hoping for was greater than what they saw. What they were believing for was greater than what they were actually encountering. Hallelujah. David had a promise from God. God said, pursue, and you will surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. He kept on because that promise drove him. That promise gave him endurance. And just a little more fight, just a little more faith. I know what God has told me. David said, I'll fight until my last breath because I know the one whom I serve. If he told me to pursue, he's going to give me the strength to endure. If he told me I was going to overtake them, he's going to give me the strength to overtake the enemy. And if he said, I'm going to recover all, yeah. I'm going to take all and then some. Because the word says, now unto him who is able. Somebody say he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's Ephesians 3.20. But that's, that's my favorite scripture. That's what I live by. God, what I want, you're able to do so much more. Did David and his men feel weary? Absolutely. Do you feel weary and well-doing? Absolutely. Do you feel that it's hard to keep praying the same prayer for 10 years? Absolutely. But you know what keeps us going? You know what keeps us going Sunday after Sunday? When, some, when sometimes we see empty chairs, the promise of a dream. Them doors are going to bust wide open. And I saw people running to the house of God. They're bumping elbows to get in these doors. And I'm turning around thinking, where did all these people come from? I know that God said, keep pursuing, Becky. Keep pursuing, Shane, because you're going to, without fail, you're going to surely overtake the enemy and what he's trying to do in this community, in this area. And without fail, you're going to recover all. What are you going to recover? You're going to recover those that were rejected by others. You're going to recover those that have been oppressed by Satan and, and, and possessed by Satan. You're going to recover all. We got to make up our minds. What we were promised is greater than what we're seeing right now. If God said it's going to happen, if God started it, guess what? He's going to be faithful to complete it. There are things that the enemy has stolen from you that has your name on it, and he knows it. 
That's why he's dancing around, being merry. I stole their kids. I got them in the world. I stole their spouse. I got them in the world. I did this. I did that. Do you know that I, I, I learned something from the time that, that we, that Shane and myself were going through that. It was a, it was a year. But it seemed like 10 years. It was one year. He wasn't just teaching Shane something. He was teaching me something. Don't give in to what you see. Because had I known that God was taking this time to prepare and mold Shane into the position that he's in right now. God taught me, you stand in the gap for him. You don't back down. You don't let the enemy have his way. But you pursue until you recover all. Because you're surely going to overtake him. I remember standing in, in our living room. You see, we want to fix things ourselves. And me and my mouth wanted to fix things and be done with it. And he said, you can't fix this. And after God said that to me, if he never comes back, what are you going to do? Is your relationship with me dependent on his? Because you're not saved because of him. Amen. You're saved because of me. Amen. Where do I fit in? So I said, okay, God, I hear you loud and clear. I began praying and interceding from that point on. I began saying, calling the things that are not as though they were. I said, God, I thank you that Shane is walking in the power and anointing that you're pouring on him. God, I thank you that you're preparing him for something greater, something greater. I didn't even know what I was praying. Something greater than our eyes could ever even see or that our minds could even comprehend. God, I thank you. And I told him, I said, there's going to come a day. I was telling it to him, but I wanted the enemy to know. I said, there's coming a day that you will say, thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for not giving up on me. See, whether it's your... Because, see, there was a time that worlds were reversed. That I got so down and deep in depression. Nobody else knew it but him. Because I, I put a smile on my face. But when you're one, you know. Amen. You know. Amen. He said, what is this thing? Why are you... Why does this thing have a hold over you? I said, I don't know. All I know is if God doesn't change something, he just needs to go ahead and take me out. Because there's no joy there. There's no happiness. It's funny how God prepares and then he flips the roles. Because this one that he's prepared now, he can step in and do for that one the thing that that one did for them. Yes. He prayed with me. He prayed over me. And he did not give up on me. Little did we know that there was something greater on the inside of us. God said you got to pursue. You can't lay back for the 200. You can't lay back because you don't see nothing happening. You don't. You can't stop what you're doing because I could have stopped on the hill of Golgotha, but I kept going because I loved you enough to endure. How much do you love God? David was driven and motivated, motivated by the instruction of the Lord. David was motivated and driven by the instruction of the Lord. David was motivated and driven by the instruction of the Lord. 
What are you motivated by? If it's anything else by the, by the word of God, you need to toss it out because it's not going to work. It's not, it's not going to bring forth anything like the word of God. It said, David smote them from twilight even until the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David would cover all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking. Neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. He recovered all. I'm going to ask you this morning. What do you see? Do you see devastation or do you see the promise of God? But see, when David looked at Goliath, he saw the promise of God. He didn't see a giant, he saw the promise of God. When he saw that burned city of Ziklag, when he saw the absence of his wives and his children and all the people's family members, he didn't see the fire. He saw the promise of God. I'm asking you, what do you see this morning? Do you see your circumstance as it is or do you see the promise of God? Because see, when you see, when you fully see the promise of God, you're going to be the one dancing. Yeah. Even in the middle of the fire, when your children say, I hate you, I don't want nothing to do with you, I'm still dancing because I believe the promise of the Lord. I believe when God said pursue, for you will surely overtake them and without fail recover all. That should give you the joy down deep within your spirit that says my eyes are not going to sway me today. I believe in the report of the Lord. Next time the enemy wants to tell you, well, it's done, I told you. You've been praying that same prayer for 25 years. And has it changed? No, it's gotten worse. You need to have that Holy Ghost boldness to say, it ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over, it ain't over until God says it's over with. And when God says it's over with, we're already winners. We're already, because we're going to have the very thing that he promises in our hands. Because I'm going to pray over those that want prayer. And I'm just going to say pursue. I'm going to say pursue. Because God has made us to be more than conquerors. He's made us to overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. We don't overcome by our moanings, groanings, and complainings. We don't overcome by what or speaking what we see in the natural. But when we speak, I am blessed and highly favored. My family is serving God. Yeah. And you may have some that say, no, they're not. They're out of the nightclub. They're out drinking and getting drunk. They're out of the, the drug house. They're shooting up every night. They're doing everything but serving God. Oh, but that's what you see. Lord, open their spiritual eyes that they may see what I see. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah. I forgot y'all were back there. Glory to God. I think there's some people in here 